to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of a crack in creation by Jennifer Doudner, The New Power to Control Evolution. So Jennifer Doudner won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, with her colleague, Emmanuelle Charpentier. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm. Uh, And these two women basically won the Nobel Prize for their massive discovery and harnessing the power of CRISPR which we're going to talk about in this episode. I don't know what's a bigger deal, them winning the Nobel Prize, or if Walter Isaacson writes a biography Mm. about you. He's written a biography about Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, who else? Einstein. Einstein. I think he did Benjamin Franklin as well. And Doudna. Imagine being in that tier of Einstein, da Vinci, and Jobs, and now Doudna. Well, she definitely deserves that scale because as we're about to learn in this episode, this could be one of the most impactful things in our lifetime and we're really just at the beginning phases of it basically for the last billions of years we've been going through this process of evolution you know darwin's theory survival of the fittest there's tiny little mutations and the ones that best fit to the environment are the ones that uh, persevere throughout the species Uh, and up till now really life has been shaped by this sort of natural process so, yeah, very cheeky little mutation and then over a very, 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 very long period of time, uh, natural selection just tweaks different species to come up with entirely different new ones. A little bit closer to today's present, about 10,000 years ago with agriculture, if you listen to Guns, Germs and Steels, we, we learned how we domesticated plants and it was really an unconscious process. But nevertheless, we were actually altering DNA and editing genes, again, in a very slow yeah. fashion. So rather than this natural selection, it was more of a, a selection, I guess, right, where we were choosing the, you know, the blade of wheat that produced more seeds per stalk or whatever. We're like, oh, that's a pretty good one. Let's plant more of those. And like gradually over time, by picking the right sort of seeds, the ones that either survived the best when a frost came along or the ones that were most resistant to a specific mold or mm. whatever it was, we'd, we'd be picking the best ones and this process of natural selection became sort of more human selection, but it was still a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. And then fast forward to today, things cannot be any more different to that because scientists and Jennifer, they've succeeded in bringing this primordial success that took a very, very long time to be fully under human control and can be done in instant, these crazy. these modifications. <laughs> very crazy. So in this episode, we're going to talk about, we're going to first give a little bit of a teaser to give a bit of excitement about the potential of if you harness CRISPR uh, in the right way, what you can do. Then we're going to dive into the technical stuff, wish us luck on that one. And then we're going to talk about, I guess, the cool shit, the possibilities uh, that are seemingly endless once we work out this whole CRISPR thing. Okay, so just before we do the deep dive, what we're talking about here with CRISPR, we've got this new found ability to go in, insert, edit, or delete any specific gene that we want in any living animal or plant's genome. And this is far simpler and more effective than any other gene manipulation technology that you might have ever heard of. This goes, just knocks that one out of the park, and it's in a complete uh, quantum leap in this field. It's some pretty wild stuff. So what some scientists did was they found... The, uh, the gene that corresponds to this growth hormone in pigs and they knock that little one out so that it didn't tell the pig to grow and basically you end up with these micro pigs uh, that are basically the size of like a, a, a cat, basically the, the micro pig or the teacup pig that are now pets mm. that are a pig but small. Yeah, you can do all sorts of stuff with animals. What's that Netflix documentary I told you about? I don't remember do what remember? it was called. Oh, this is going <laughs> to kill There's one me. called Human Nature. And there was no, one there's called another the other, one. The Human Nature is a phenomenal one. The other one's <laughs> really interesting. Anyway, the first scene in the movie, um, there's a backyard uh, CRISPR gene editing dude and he's, no joke, whacking off a dog. Oh, Jesus. And to actually get CRISPR into that germline <laughs> and turn into like a Schwarzenegger dog <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. And the, you, you probably, you might have seen, you know, the uh, the internet memes that are actually true of like they, they inject rabbits with like stuff from jelly like a, a, a gene from a jellyfish that makes them glow in the dark and stuff like that or like a goat where they if they find the exact right thing they find this thing where the goat can grow more muscle which is obviously more meat for when you sell it and also grow longer hair so that when you when you shave off the, the goat to get the hair fibers you can then sell that as well mm. 
So that's in the animal kingdom. In the plant world, we can again take new steps in editing crop genomes and paving the way for another set of agricultural advances, probably comparable to the green revolution that allows us to feed today's population. And obviously, huge improvements in agricultural productivity has flow-on benefits with land use and, and all different areas like that. In the, in the health world, they've found that there are some things that they can do to improve Obviously, these massive health things going around the world, malaria, uh, the Zika virus, they're all carried by mosquitoes. And they found that there's one thing, one little tiny gene, if they flick that one off, then that mosquito no longer transmits those diseases, which kill tens of or hundreds of millions of people every single year. Yeah, I think this was again in Human Nature, the documentary where it's called uh, Gene Driving. And what they can do is they can get the mosquito and somehow manipulate it so there's only male offspring. Mm-hmm. And that means in a couple of generations, no females. And, and because of that, then uh, they're all going to die off <laughs> pretty quick. It's pretty much say that it's, uh, it's, it's cool, good shit, but it's also equally terrifying. It's like a, finding a nuclear power or something where you could use it to blow up the world or you can use it to, to en- energize the world essentially. <laughs> So that brings us on to the next one, which is editing the germline, where you you not only edit this living organism's gene, but all the organisms in that family tree going forward. So, you know, some genetic diseases you can just remove entirely for your kids and their kids and so forth. Yeah, as you probably learned in year nine science class that you're, basically your genetic makeup is half from your mom, half from your dad. And uh, so you get half of each and these little things, the recessive genes, like you're going to carry on forever and pass on to your kids. But now what they're saying is if you can knock it out of yourself, not only are you knocking it out of yourself, you're also knocking it out of then every single step on that family tree beyond you. Yeah, and essentially uh, you're really coming up with your own species. So you could actually come up with an atom, be the first one to come up with the atom species, knock out a few different genes and uh, be different enough. According to the Bible, aren't we all of the atom species? I guess we are in that sense, but this is the new one. This is your own, your own species. One. So, of course, the issue comes here that the natural selection and the random mutations, they happen very, very slowly over time and we ad- adapt to the environment around us. If we go into uh, making our own mutations and our own, not natural selection anymore, but our own enforced selection, we don't actually sort of know what's going to happen. If you kill off all the mosquitoes, what's the bad thing that's going to happen? If you turn a, a rabbit into a glow-in-the-dark rabbit, what's the, what's the bad thing that's going to happen? Yeah, we're looking at it through the Nassim Taleb kind of spectrum and how the silent evidence fallacy where the, we're really very poor at accounting for unknown unknowns, humans throughout history. So uh, this does fall right into that category where we're manipulating something with a complex system and all of a sudden everything could just very quickly turn to shit. It also brings a whole bunch of other ethical considerations. So you might think, okay, well, if we can find a cure for HIV AIDS where you turn off the gene that's receptive to it and you can no longer contract HIV or AIDS, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you think, oh, we can cure sickle cell anemia, yeah, that's probably a good thing. But then what if you think, oh, well, eventually, like if you extrapolate this out, they're saying that one use of CRISPR is you get to the point where it almost becomes like a, a menu for your kids. Like if you go in and say, okay, I want to, oh, we found the thing that causes Down syndrome. Yeah, let's turn that one off. Oh, we found, oh, you can bump it up a few IQ points. Yeah, let's go for that one. Let's, uh, oh, do you want blonde hair, brown hair, red hair? Mm-hmm. Do you want green hair, purple hair, blue hair? Maybe that's a premium version. Uh, there's all these things that you, then you become, you know, you start picking off the menu of what you want your kids to be. Who's got access to that? Is it only the rich people that can afford to get the blue-haired kid uh, or bump their kid's IQ up a few points? There's a lot of considerations that then come with the power of this as well. Well, it's probably the first movie that's a good one you've actually watched that I've actually asked you about. And I know you've seen Gattaca. I I must admit, it was only forced because we had to do it at school. But yeah, I have seen it. I have seen (laughs) it. It is very prophetic in in that where it does paint a somewhat dystopian future when gene editing does come in and uh, obviously... You've got that huge upside. You can't turn this away from the young people if someone's got sickle cell or HIV or something like that. But, you know, it's very hard to let that person die and not cop all the negatives that come with it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So there's a hell of a lot of ethical considerations. Um, 
I was just hearing an interview with big old Walter Isaacson. There's basically the, there's the from that doco you were saying there's all the the rebels, the backyard guys who are just injecting themselves and doing all this crazy shit, and they're just like, oh, we don't need to worry about the ethical considerations. Mm. Let's just go for it. Then you've got the doubters of the world and all the the big dogs who are thinking, well, actually, this is some serious power. And before we just unleash this power on the world, we better think about what are some of the rules that we should put in place before we actually just start editing humans. Yuval Noah Harari was also very prophetic with this when he wrote Homo, Homo Deus, mm. where it's a new species of humans evolving. And let's say you're only the rich and the elite have got access to the best versions of CRISPR and gene editing, uh, where we've always had this belief that all humans are equal. In the future, that might not be true. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> you might have another species that just kicks the shit out of us homo <laughs> sapiens. So, there's uh, a lot of ethical stuff that we need to work out before we just um, go gung-ho. But I think no one asked human species. Well, I think we're just going to go cowboy and just see what happens. Well, there was that... Uh there was that the the doctor in in China basically who did go gung ho. So Doudna, she had it in the the test tubes. They were able to edit it, and then they were able to then edit human cells. And then you got this guy who was just attending all these conferences, and he worked out how to do it. And he just went just did it. He just put he had these two twin girls that were born, and they can no longer contract HIV AIDS. Obviously, it's a good thing, but everyone's like, oh, hang on, man, we got to talk about this shit first. But he's just he's just gone for it. Oh, what a legend. <laughs> Okay, so this is when we're going to start getting a little bit technical to talk about all this. We're going to talk about uh, the genome, which is what a, in 1920, a German botanist, Hans Winkler, said it was, well, it's a mix of gene and chromosome. And basically, this genome refers to the entire set of genetic instructions found inside a cell. So basically, this is everything that makes up who you are, boils down to these, this one little set of, well, little, this one set of uh, instructions. So a genome is made up of a molecule called, this is a mouthful of a word, deoxybononucleic acid, DNA. <laughs> you missed the uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. Thanks, mate. Yeah. But essentially, DNA, which has four different building blocks. So we've got adenine, A, G, which is guanine, C, cysteine, and T, yeah, yeah. There's time. a typo there as well. But yeah, basically, let's go with A, G, C, T. I've got a mate who's, uh, who's messaging me all the time now just saying, <laughs> call me out it. on all my pronunciations. <laughs> you said you can't even pronounce your own name right, <laughs> which I think is true. Yeah, there's, so. a bit, there's a bit of that. Uh, and so basically, these four letters, A, G, C, T, they make up these long strings, which makes up this DNA. And basically, we've got this. This is the code that tells our body what to make. You know, make a little bit of bicep muscle here, make a little mm. bit of uh, bit of hair at the top of the head here. Mm. Well, it's pretty insane. So, literally, these four letters would tell an organism to go out there and grow gills. It might tell the organism, all right, we're going to breathe underwater. It might tell you to grow hair. It might tell you to start growing a heart. So, all these insane things comes down to these four little different. Uh, proteins which form DNA. So DNA is that famous double helix thing that wraps around like a, a twirling ladder almost and that's literally what it looks like. And different organisms and species have different amounts or different pairs of ladders as they go up, so to speak. So humans, we've got 3.2 billion DNA pairs, uh, a fly genome that contains million, millions. So you can see the difference in order of magnitude there. Yeah, and you've probably heard that we've got these 23 distinct uh, distinct pieces, these distinct chromosomes. Each of those have between 50 to 250 million letters each. And then different variations in the orders of, of those letters are going to make differences in how we look. So like a, if you've got a GCAT instead of a GCTA, maybe that means your hair is blonde instead of brown. Just from these little tiny differences, change our entire body really. So we've got the stock standard human genome where it's all, all good to go. This is a pretty standard human with those changes for hair color and stuff like that. But every now and then, a genetic mutation will happen. And as we said at the start of the episode, this has been fantastic for evolution because you have that change and that change might be better and the species improves through the survival of the fittest. But sometimes one of the changes is a, is a real horrible change. We could actually cause immense human suffering to the person. For example, uh, when it comes to sickle cell disease, which is a genetic disorder of the blood, which again causes huge suffering, one letter just swaps from A to a T out of that whole 3.2 billion letter genome. Just this one change 
dramatically changes that person's mm. life and puts them through hell essentially. Yeah, it's pretty wild stuff. So, the first, uh, before we got into the CRISPR side of things, firstly, we had to find out, well, what do all these little tiny letters mean and how do they end up? So, basically, using a metaphor, we had to learn to read before we could write. So, it started off by learning to read in the 1990s, where a whole bunch of scientists from around the world teamed up to sequence the entire human genome. It was a massive project. Uh, it was a decade-long project. It cost $3 billion. But what they ended up with was basically this, all the strings of letters throughout the entire human genome to work out what does what. So, $3 billion bucks in 10 years, you're going to be saving for a very long time if you <laughs> want to do it for yourself. But thankfully, like a lot of technologies, it does have a cost curve where it goes down exponentially. And today, it only costs a couple of hundred bucks in a couple of days. And you can get every single uh, letter within your DNA read and understand your whole entire genome and see where things are a little bit off, see where things are right and and so forth. But of course, ultimately, this at this point is merely a diagnostic tool. So, this, is, this can tell you you're reading uh, your own genome and you know what each thing means, but you can't really do anything about it to change it at this point. So, as you can imagine, we're moving now into the second half of this metaphor where it gets really, really interesting and that's where we're learning to write and start to just change and tweak the DNA in a really conscious manner. And so, what they found was this CRISPR thing that we've been talking about, CRSPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So, obviously, it's a lot easier to just say CRISPR than to say all of that stuff. So, what CRISPR is, so thinking about your DNA where you got all these letters together, what scientists found was that CRISPR was a specific part of, of DNA that occurred everywhere within the, within the body. So, that big mouthful, a few of what the acronym stands for. First of all, you've got clustered, meaning you've got a certain specific DNAs that are clustered throughout the sequence. There are also repeats. So, you'd have CRISPR DNA, something else, CRISPR DNA, something else, CRISPR DNA, something else. So, these letters keep repeating themselves. Regularly interspaced, pretty much as I just said then. Uh, palindrome, meaning a sequence of letters read the same left to right. So, when scientists saw this, they're like, why the hell are these DNA repeating everywhere and forming this fashion? And a lot of the times, like things that evolve specific ways, usually it's got a purpose. And this is what they found. It did have a purpose and that's what it came to dealing as an immune response to new viruses coming into the body. So, what they found that viruses did was a little piece of bacteria, a little virus would pop in, make its way into the cell, into the DNA uh, and the, the, the body would then have this immune response to fight it off. So, it learned how to fight this off so that it didn't die. Basically, what happened was uh, they would cut the DNA it would then insert what it needed to do to fight this virus and then whack a CRISPR on the other side of it. So now, next time this little virus comes along, your DNA already knows, well, this is the exact sequence of code that I need to kill this virus off. Yeah, so as you say, it comes in the first time because there's nothing there within your immune system. There's nothing within your DNA to do it. But what the body has is this thing called a Cas9 protein. It goes out, slaps up and cuts up the, the incoming virus and because the body wants to remember it later, it slaps it onto the in-between those CRISPR elements. So, there's very, very specific DNA codes in between this CRISPR to be able to target at a later date. So, it's like that idea of vaccines, you know, if you get a, a chickenpox vaccine where they actually send a little bit of the chickenpox virus into you and then the body learns, okay, well, here's this virus the old Cas9 comes and chops up the virus and saves a little bit for later just so your DNA remembers how to fight it. So, basically, that's what's been happening uh, in our immune system pretty much forever. Mm, so, it's, they just go, naturally. So, it's the immune system's got this, uh, this search and destroy mission with this Cas9. And also, when they found it, they Jennifer, the innovator and entrepreneur that she is, she actually thought, all right, this is pretty interesting. Maybe we can start using mm. it in different ways. And this is what they've really come up with in this five-step process to be able to literally be editing our DNA. Yeah, so basically the virus has been doing it and our body's just been naturally fighting them off and changing the DNA itself forever. And now they've figured, oh, well, let's try and harness this bad boy and let's try and do what we actually want it to do. Yeah, so in order for us right now to be using this within ourselves, 
Firstly, obviously need to sequence your genome. As we said earlier, this is very possible now for a couple hundred bucks. This is reading essentially. Then we get a bit of this Cas9 protein, which is extremely cheap now. It's literally a liquid you can inject into your body. Mix it up with some specific information, which is RNA. Hopefully, we're not getting too technical here. And then you can put that in your body and literally it can go in this search and destroy mission. And now scientists can edit genomes by modifying, editing, or deleting new sequences entirely. So the first time Jennifer used this was on a sickle cell. And as we said, that sickle cell, uh, there's that one tiny switch, the switch from an A to a T, or was it a T to an A? Anyway, whichever way the wrong way was, Jennifer said, well, if Head that's... for a scientist to get that wrong, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I know. D to an A and then, oh, sure, oh, I gave it a, a D. A <laughs> Basically, there was a, the, either the A or the T was wrong and Jennifer thought, well, if we can just switch that one letter, switch it from a T to an A or an A to a T, whatever it's meant to be, maybe we can cure the sickle cell. And then in the test tube, they mixed up this Cas9, the, which was the old scissors that went out and cut up the virus and cut up the DNA and cut and pasted basically. And they fixed it. And basically in the test tube, they're like, oh, it worked. Phenomenal. <laughs> probably <laughs> not quite a, understatement, probably, mate. Quite, probably not quite that simple as it's well probably one of those things like, more to it than that <laughs> yeah well in theory she's probably thinking this is just that ridiculous surely it's just not <laughs> yeah. going to come through and then she just saw it and it, the letter changed so easily and that's when she thought alright we're, we're onto something yeah, we're onto something it's insane yeah. fast forwarding to today I think that was in about 2015 so it was only what six years ago maybe earlier I think it was than that. 2013 was when they first did it on humans so what less than a decade old and it's been absolutely exhilarating she's saying to see the amount of technologies possible just from the few dozen scientists that she was working in these early days so as uh, this is obviously a very very powerful thing if you if you can be harnessed in the right way that's when you get this massive influx of you know scientists trying to work it out people with lots of money trying to work it out and with all this brain power and all this money power flowing in obviously we're starting to work some stuff out everything's getting cheaper everything's going to get easier and as you said now you've got blokes in their backyard jerking off dogs <laughs> to try and edit them yeah it's pretty insane i think this bloke uh, do you reckon was this bloke was, was he i reckon that was just an excuse he was he's just into dogs yeah and I he's agree. like oh i'm doing crispr guys I, i'm doing crispr yeah. i swear <laughs> That is so true. Surely you could just find another way of doing it. He jerk off himself. Actually, that's worse. Let's not go there. That's disgusting. But what we're really getting down to your backyard kits cost you two thousand bucks. Set it up and really costs nothing. And, and there's it's really been democratized to the point where anyone can use it around the world. Um, Jennifer uses says. AdGene is like a Netflix for plasmid. You can actually do this certain mixture and code and put it online and pretty much uh, distribute it in any way you like. And scientists are really starting to use it in ways that are defying our imagination. Imagine tomatoes that can sit in a pantry and slowly ripen for months without rotting or plants that can better weather climate change, or mosquitoes that can't transmit malaria, or ultra-muscular dogs that can make for fearsome partners for police and soldiers, or cows that don't grow horns anymore. These things seem far-fetched. They seem like a bit of an imagination, but these actually already exist thanks to gene editing. And of course, this is just the beginning. We are on the cusp of a new era in the history of life on Earth. So this is an age where humans, we have the unprecedented level of control over genetic composition of the species that cohabit our planet. And it's not going to be long until we can bend nature in the ways, in ways that we've been really dreaming of making movies about and everything like that since prehistory. So the one thing that, uh, one movie I have seen, Jurassic Park, I can claim to have seen that one. Uh, he was actually pretty close, this bloke, really. Mm. So basically, they found what they found some old DNA that was in, trapped in amber, and they injected that into a frog and made a dinosaur. Uh, and it's actually not too far fetched. So they've all. actually been doing now. They're trying to bring the woolly mammoth back from extinction by getting a bit of woolly mammoth DNA and injecting it into elephants, and hoping that can they can bring it back. Yeah, I think the uh, I, th I think how they said in the book how they're going to do that one is they've got elephant DNA. And they know exactly the woolly mammoth DNA, so they can compare the two. And oh, it's kind of turn an elephant into a correct, oh, wow. and put in the offspring because they it, it's kind of predictable the differences in the elephant DNA, like the ones that grow more hair and mm. uh, a bit more meat and a bit more sizey and all that kind of stuff. So they can do that and then have 
give birth from a, another elephant, a woolly mammoth, Oof. as you do. That's pretty wild. That's pretty <laughs> wild. Another, uh, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know what the benefit of doing the wo- woolly mammoth is. Is there a point to it, or just because I can? It's cool, man. Yeah. Well, we, we, if we, uh, none of us like extinction. Yeah. So using so that we, reasoning, basically shouldn't we, we be equally positive for the <laughs> de-extinction? Basically, if we're fucking up, because humans screwed up the climate they died off so now like oh well, we owe you one we'll bring you yeah, back yeah we owe you one <laughs> okay that makes <laughs> sense that makes sense uh probably transplants potentially more important mm. uh at the moment in the u.s there's 124,000 people currently on the waiting list for some kind of transplant uh but there are only about 28,000 procedures carried out each year there's 22 people die every single day waiting for a transplant and obviously if they're only doing 30,000 a year there's 124,000 on the list that keeps growing day by day uh, I'd say there's a fair amount of those people that are never going to get the transplant that they need. Yeah, so CRISPR now allows us to generate pigs with organs suitable for human transplant. <laughs> would have thought they would have come up with a better animal than a pig. <laughs> like marketing-wise, that's not going to sell, even if it is yeah. the most functional one. I don't know if, like obviously you'd think like the you know like a monkey or a chimpanzee is pretty close to us, yeah. but maybe the pigs, maybe it just seems too cruel to grow a chimpanzee to take their heart out. Maybe mm. the pigs. So for whatever reason, pigs. Ground. Yeah, it could be that pigs. Pigs do it, but they can actually edit the genes that have the response that within the pig and say, "Hang on, this is not a, this is not one of my." Tra-. <laughs> they can turn that off and just trick their body into just growing keep growing human. it. Human. So what do they? What do they do? Like human, like all organs, hearts, lungs. Hope so. Yeah. Imagine if you could just swap. Um, you know, just keep. It's like the the car. Just keep going. The mechanic Getting and just keep parts. going. Spare parts. <laughs> Gosh, that's crazy. And then, of course, probably one, probably the biggest one of all is trying to look for ways to cure cancer. This comes from s- slight changes in the DNA, these rogue mutations that then lead to tumors and cancers growing. If a scientist can cure that, I think they're onto a real winner. And a lot of it really does just come down to cancer research. Usually, we had to get those poor old lab rats again, yeah. that you're getting the poor end of the deal in pretty much every study of <laughs> yeah. all time. I love how they use lab rats for everything, both health, psychological, and then just just torture purposes as well. Yeah, actually, I just saw the notes. I thought the lab rats aren't getting a better deal, <laughs> getting even a worse end of the <laughs> oh, deal God. here, because you can specifically change the DNA within the poor lab rat to create cancer, oh. and then and then try to fix it. Then try and fix it, and if it doesn't work, bad luck for the lab rat. Yeah, maybe we yeah. can do something else for the lab rats. Maybe bring, if we kill them all off by trying too much wild shit on them, we can bring them back. Yeah, maybe we can yeah. make them like human consciousness or something. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's definitely some ethical considerations that we need to think about. So, Aldous Huxley, again, who was very prophetic, like a lot of books, wrote in Brave New World about... Have a, you read that? No, have you? Oh, mate. I've finally got one up That's, on you. Is that another book, uh, school one where you had to was, read it? Actually, it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't claim it. You can't claim it, mate. But uh, he wrote of a dystopia in 2540 and that dystopia is something what we may be entering into now where we've got the power to control our own genetic future and the de- destination we're heading to. Yeah, that power, it's awesome but it's also terrifying and probably deciding how we actually handle this power could be the biggest challenge we've ever faced and of course, it's only just the beginning. We've read over 350 awesome books uh, and people always ask us, what's your favorite book of all time? Uh, it's very hard to do. So, what we actually did was we, we created a document of our top 50 favorite books of all time. We had to have a few wars as to which books got in and which books didn't, but the end list is a phenomenal list of 50 awesome books. We've given you a little teaser of what you'll find in each of those books, plus we've ranked them in order from 50 all the way to our combined number one. If you want to get your hands on this document, it's a freebie. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash top 50. That's whatyouwillearn.com slash T-O-P-5-0.